Brian Barnett is just a regular guy. He's not a doctor. He has no legal license in any field of mental or emotional health. Brian Barnett merely shares the insights he's gained from his personal experiences for anybody who may choose to use such information as he or she personally chooses while accepting full responsibility for his or her own individual thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and actions. Brian Barnett assumes no responsibility whatsoever for anybody's individual choice to expose himself or herself to any information that Brian Barnett shares. And by listening to this program, you're acknowledging that you, and only you, are responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, and actions. Happy Thursday, everybody. It's actually Friday. Forgive me for that. I've been quite busy. And uh, so, it is actually Friday, but... uh, You know, we can't break with tradition, so that's why I say, happy Thursday. So you're probably going to be hearing this on a Friday night or a Saturday or Sunday. You might even wait until Monday morning when you're driving to work. But whatever the case, happy Thursday. This is Brian Barnett. You're listening to The Last Symptom, and boy, am I happy you're here. A very sweet friend of mine, Abby, says the following... I first found Brian two to three years ago and have avidly followed him ever since. I eagerly look forward to the new episode of his podcast every Friday. I took part in the last Symptom Fundamentals class group. I learned a great deal. Currently, my mood is elevated and I'm expecting an episode of full-blown mania soon, which I'm dreading. Well, Abby, since uh, you look forward to this show every week, and since I'm, I just so happen to be quite fond of you, and because it sounds like you're afraid that you're going to be going through a rough time soon, I wanted to give you a little shout out and let you know that you're on my mind. Also, I figured I'd share some details about myself that you and others might find helpful. I think I might have mentioned in the past that, in the past, whenever I've had to have an unwanted encounter with my dad, even if I only had to have a discussion about my dad with somebody, even you, the audience, that this continued to affect me for days. Now, you'll remember, if you've been listening to The Last Symptom for a while now, that All feelings that we experience are preceded by what? What is everything we feel preceded by? By a thought, right? So everything we feel has been preceded by some thought. Memories are just thoughts. Perceptions are also just thoughts. How about dreams? Yeah, Dreams are also just thoughts. Have you ever got out of bed in the morning in a lousy mood? And you get your day started and and you're still in a lousy mood. And throughout the whole day, you just feel like you're in a lousy, irritable mood and you're not sure why. Well, it might have been because of a negative dream you had before waking up that you can't even consciously remember. You know, the remnants of it are in there, unbeknownst to you, just bouncing around, making you feel irritable. Well, at some point, I realized that this was what was happening any time I had to talk in detail about my dad. You see, the days would pass. I would completely forget about having had that conversation about my dad. And yet, I would be irritable and pretty impatient and short with other people for days, sometimes a whole week afterwards. This doesn't really happen too much anymore uh, as time has gone on, but do you know what I realized when this was happening? Well, I sat down and I did an analysis on myself. What was the pattern? And uh, I finally put two and two together. I realized that this was happening 
Specifically, whenever I found myself in a situation where I had to have a discussion about my dad, and I realized that my subconscious mind was then continuing to hang on to those thoughts, and it was like walking around with a splinter in my toe, or like having a piece of chicken <laughs> stuck between my teeth, you know, that I couldn't get out. You know, you, you fight, fight with it. It's just driving you nuts, and you, you got your tongue up there in your teeth trying to get that out, and it's just pestering you to death. Once I realized that these periods of irritability and unhappiness were happening, notice what I did. I first sat down to do some detective work and to try to figure out if I could distinguish some kind of pattern. Once I figured out the pattern, what happened? Well, once I figured out the pattern... I was able to determine what was causing it. That it had to be ongoing unconscious or subconscious thoughts or memories about my dad that was pestering me. When I had this realization, what did this make it possible for me to then do? It made it possible for me any time I found myself talking about my dad to make a conscious note to myself that for the next several days or even for the following week, I could expect to be irritable. Once I knew that I could expect to be irritable, then what could I do? Well, then that allowed me to give people that I had to interact with in that following week a little disclaimer. I would say something like, listen, I may be irritable when you interact with me for the next few days. And I, I just want to apologize up front. You know, it's not your fault. I'm just dealing with some family disappointments. Uh, and I just, I'm just working through it. Also, because I knew there was a high likelihood that I would be irritable and snappy, all of this understanding about what was happening and why allowed me to avoid certain types of conversations or interactions and to save those things for another time. You know, it's like uh, when you're tired and hungry is not the best time, probably, to get into a conversation with your best friend about politics. If you, if you and your friend are just completely opposite as far as political ideology goes, you know, when, when you are conscious of the fact that you're, you're starving, you've got a headache, and you didn't sleep very well the night before, and so you're, you're running on a deficit of sleep, a wise person does not get into a conversation that has a li high likelihood of getting one riled up, right? Not, uh, not given those conditions. What does the wise person do? The wise person says, you know, I'd love to get into a discussion with you about this because I've got a, some strong opinions of my own. But I'll tell you what, I, I'm dealing with his headache today, uh, got an ingrown toenail, and I didn't sleep last night. So now's probably just not the, the best time. Let, let's have this discussion another time when I'm feeling better, all right? And your friend says, all right. You see, that's, that's what the wise person does. So me being aware of what was happening and why gave me that power to say, you know, there are just some things in the next few days I'm probably not going to want to get into. I'll just save that for, uh, for once the effects of this irritability have had time to uh, run their course. At any rate, you see that the solution was not changing all the things causing me to feel irritable. Uh, I can't step into a time machine, travel back in time, and undo all of the injustices I suffered with my dad as a kid, can I? That ain't doable. Also, I can't entirely make myself forget about the injustices or, or never ever think about them or never dream about them or never discuss them. That also is just not doable. 
Also, is my irritability, is my, are my feelings the problem? No, your feelings are never the problem. My feelings of irritability were, were not the problem. <laughs> Wouldn't you say that disappointment and irritability are precisely the appropriate feelings to experience when thinking about past injustices you have suffered? Of course they are. So my feelings were never the problem. And since they were never the, the problem, they certainly didn't need to be fixed. You see, if something's not a problem, then you don't need to change it, right? So I don't need to change the fact that when I think about the injustices of my past, it makes me irritable for a few days. I don't need to change that. What I need to do is accept that that is precisely the appropriate thing to feel, right? It's just what I feel. But understanding the real nature of what was going on, you see, now I'm no longer being controlled by these things or they're no longer catching me off guard. I know exactly what's happening. I know what's going to happen before it even happens. Think about the power that now gives me. So it gives me power over how to handle that situation. It made it possible for me to make plans ahead of time for how to deal with what the pattern uh, just was, what I knew would, would occur. So, Abby, I hope that that gives you some uh, things to work with there in your own circumstances, and uh, I just want to let you know I'm, I'm proud of you for all the work you've been doing. And, of course, nobody knows who I'm talking about here, but Abby knows. And uh, so that's what I wanted to do that for. Uh, let's see. There's somebody also in Australia, an EMS driver, an emergency, uh, an ambulance driver down there in Australia. And I had talked about her on the show not too long ago. In that episode, I had talked about how when she hears this, she's just going to run off the road. <laughs> with her ambulance. So she wrote me a, a message, an email, and said that uh, that she did, in fact, almost run off the road when she realized I was talking about her. So another shout out to her. I, I appreciated your message. Also, uh, another listener who I was talking to the other day said that uh, she puts me on to fall asleep. That's how exciting and energetic the last symptom podcast is it puts people to sleep. So what I might do at the end of this show, just for her and for all you other folks who go to sleep listening to uh, the last symptom podcast is uh, I might read you a little something and, and that's the way we'll close out the show. All right. Back in about the year 2002 ish, I lived in a, in an apartment building Right next door to my apartment was an old woman. She was about 84 years old. Her name was Ida, and she was Cuban. And I was learning Spanish. I was four or five years into learning Spanish at that point, and so it was a great privilege for me at that time, a a great uh, convenience having Ida as my next door neighbor. I was in my early 20s. And like I said, Ida was about 84 years old. And she walked around. I remember she walked around the apartment complex with a walker and just bent all the way over that walker. Very slow. I mean, like a, like a turtle slow or a sloth slow. But she had such a personality, and I, I just loved her to death. And she started inviting me next door to have espresso with her every day. And that became a tradition for us, a a routine. So every day in my 20s while living next door to Ida, I would hear this little tap, tap, tap on my door. And when I would open it up, there would be Ida. And she'd say, Quieres tomar un poco de espresso? Let's go have some espresso. So I would usually drop what I was doing and I'd go and sit in her apartment and she would tell me stories about Cuba 
and about her life and uh, all about how what a rotten skunk Fidel Castro is. And uh, she actually she told me the story about when she was a little girl. That was when Fidel Castro, when his regime took over the, the Cuban island. And uh, a lot of the people, a lot of the neighbors that she had at that time, uh, some of her family members were murdered uh, during that, that government takeover. She first fled to Spain, and then she ended up in the United States. Boy, she had a sense of humor. I remember she told me one time this story about some diplomat getting off the plane in Cuba, coming down the steps where all the media was, you know, and they had the microphone set up right there and everything. And Ida, Ida says that this di- diplomat walked up to the microphone. The diplomat thought that she would try to impress everybody by talking a little bit of Spanish into the microphones. And she... <laughs> With the news cameras rolling and everything, she leaned over into the microphones and she said, Tengo tres, (laughs) tengo tres años con el deseo de visitar Cuba. I'm botching the accent on purpose because that's the way that this diplomat would have talked. It's actually tengo tres años con el deseo de visitar Cuba. Ida just laughed and laughed and laughed telling that story because uh, as you Spanish speakers know, what the diplomat had said was <laughs> when she come down off the plane steps <laughs> and spoke for the, uh, the, the media, what she said in Spanish was, I have three buttholes. <laughs> I have three buttholes. Oh, what a start. Anyway, uh, Ida just laughed and laughed and laughed telling me that story all the time. People of Cuba, I've got three buttholes. Well, anyway, I just thought uh, in Ida's memory, uh, she was 84 then, and that was 20 years ago. So it's very unlikely that uh, my dear friend Ida, my Cuban neighbor, is still out there anyway. Uh, We both moved from that apartment complex at about the same time. And I remember that Ida went to Florida where her daughter lived. And uh, at that time, I moved to Philadelphia. So we, we parted ways. And, um, but Ida gave me some gifts that I still have to this day. She gave me three books that if you ever see the videos of me on the, the official YouTube channel or over at thelastsymptom.com, uh, those books are back on the shelf behind me in the videos. Uh, and they're the most in-depth study of the Spanish language that I have yet to find. They do not make books like this anymore. And I just, I treasured them. She also gave me a, uh, some books that she had brought from Spain and some other things. But uh, the most memorable thing that she gave me was not a, a physical thing at all. It was this love of espresso. And if you've ever had espresso with a Cuban, you know that the first time almost kills you. <laughs> it almost kills you. It's so strong. And I'm a, I'm a coffee drinker. Growing up in the country, we, we always had pots of coffee ready. And in fact, we would uh, make coffee cowboy style and we would just leave it. We would just, you know, like the next day we would just reheat it. That's how we drank our coffee. It was just stout and strong. We never put anything in our coffee. So just black And that's the way I grew up. And so when Ida said, come on over and let's have some uh, espresso, I was like, yeah, no problem. And she served it in this little tiny uh, doll cup, you know, which I felt kind of ridiculous drinking out of. But she served it up. I sipped it and it, it grew hair on my butt. Let's just say that. It was stout stuff. So at first it was a little jarring. But as time went on, I really came to love it. You know, that, um, I've got all these influences in my life that that have made me who I am. When I was in Philadelphia, I was dating an Argentine woman, and she turned me on to yerba mate. So if you've never had yerba mate, 
you drink it with a special straw, which is, it's the cross between like a small spoon with holes in the, in the bowl of the spoon and a stem. It's made out of metal. And uh, that goes down below the mate and you pour hot water on top of it. That spoon straw, by the way, is called una bombilla. And you drink through that straw. When the tea runs out, you don't dump the tea. You just pour more hot water on top. Anyway, uh, I'm getting off topic, but uh, back to the espresso. Uh, Ida turned me on to it. I developed a taste for it. I uh, really liked it. And the other day I thought, you know, it's been a long time since I have been regularly, regularly drinking espresso. So <laughs> I run out and I bought this cheap really cheap espresso maker literally that's all it does it just makes like four shots of espresso at a time it's just been amazing it always makes me think of Ida and our conversations and uh, all these memories come back to me about her if you're a younger person and all of your friends are in your same age group you need to branch out you really do you you're really missing out. You need some older friends. Uh, I'm not talking about just 10 years older. I'm talking about, you know, really up there in life. It really will enrich your life in ways that you, you can't comprehend. And forever. Forever. So anyway, I just thought that I would share that story about my friend Ida, uh, what she means to me, and how uh, I go on honoring her by drinking espresso and telling people about her and, and valuing the things that she, she gave me. Before we get too much further into this, I need to talk to you about thelastsymptom.com. You hear me say it every week. That's my website full of free resources. There's also paid services there, such as one-on-one -on -one conversations with me, either over the phone or by means of Zoom. This service, by the way, is international. I talk to people from all over the world, and I've been honored lately to get to talk to some people from Australia, uh, the UK, uh, India, uh, and other parts of the world. But now I have an official announcement to make about the Last Symptom Fundamental Structured Course, pre-recorded course. You heard me mention it last week. And you probably heard me mention it the week before, but if you visit now thelastsymptom.com, you'll notice that uh, there is a new paid service available there. It is the Last Symptom two-week fundamentals course, now available in a pre-recorded format. This is very exciting. Until now, I'd only offered it in a live format. So now it's available in a pre recorded format and I've already got people signed up for it going through that course this is not just a money making scheme for me I put much thought and time into developing this program and then into recording the program and editing the program and making it available to everybody I put all this work into it in the interest of genuinely helping others I was talking to somebody the other day uh, literally this week who said that person was now going through DBT for their fourth time. Think about that. Going through DBT for their fourth time. You've heard me say before in the past that DBT is not going to fix your borderline personality disorder. It, it will provide you with a set of tools to get you through moments. You know, so it's like an aspirin. Uh, it's like a Band-Aid, a temporary ba a thing, right? So you find yourself in a situation. It helps you develop coping strategies, you know, my one of my least favorite words, for dealing with that situation. So, you know, I'm not saying that DBT has no use whatsoever. My problem has always been that it is marketed as a borderline personality disorder cure or as, like, the big answer to borderline personality disorder. It's not that at all. It's just, it's a bag of tricks. So if you ever needed a better example of that being true, it's this person I was talking to who was going through it for the fourth time. Why would you have to go 
through a program that is the big answer for borderline personality disorder four times if it's the, if it's the answer, right? So I told her that this pre-recorded course that I have developed blows DBT out of the water. If you're serious about authentically recovering from borderline personality disorder, this will greatly, greatly improve your odds at that. It provides the foundation upon which you can build the rest of your recovery. People ask, how is it different, for example, than listening to this podcast weekly? It's different in that it provides you the structure that you need in order for all of these pieces to come together in a very cohesive way. Also, I go into detail that I just can't go into here. There are 28 chapters in this pre-recorded course. Do you know what that means? It means there's almost 28 hours of presentation and of discussion about borderline personality disorder. Do you know how much I charge for a one-on-one phone conversation with me? I charge $150. Do you know how much I charge for this course? $450. With seven months access, so you you enroll in the course, then you have ongoing access for seven months, and it's a two-week course. So you can go through the course as many times as you want for those seven months to really digest this information. But do the math. If I charge $150 for a phone call, and I'm only charging $450 for almost, not all of the... uh, Chapters are an hour long. Some of them are like 38 minutes long and others are 45 minutes long. But, you know, you're looking at like 25 hours, 26 hours of discussion about borderline personality disorder as well as a visual presentation. That means you get access to the entire course for seven months for what it would cost to have three phone calls with me. Three one-hour phone calls. So some may balk at the enrollment cost, but I'd just like to remind you about that. This course, by far, is the most cost-effective option for your recovery. This Last Symptom Fundamentals pre-recorded course works with your schedule, no matter what your schedule is. I speak and I offer a visual presentation, and you simply have to watch Listen, ruminate, take notes, and work to understand the deeper implications of the things I present in the course. And yes, naturally, this new service is also intended as a continuing source of income for the last symptom so that the last symptom can keep thriving and developing other resources to offer. I'm currently working on a a follow-up course not a follow-up course, a a companion course for friends and family. Still, because I know that not everybody can afford the cost of the Last Symptom Fundamentals course, particularly those in various parts of the world where financial realities are different than those where I live here in the United States, it, it is my intention to offer some discounted coupons to specific individuals soon. And primarily, I'm thinking about some of my Indian friends who I'm eager to see take this course and, and get the benefits of it. So don't worry that you've slipped under my radar and you know that I'm not aware of your needs as well. I'm willing to work with you. At the same time, the extent to which the Last Symptom Fundamentals course is supported by those who can afford the full cost will also determine how generous I'm, I'm able to be. You, you understand how that works. And uh, there is a new option within the Donate Sponsor section of thelastsymptom.com for those who would like to sponsor access to the course for those under financial hardship. You might be asking yourself, why the seven-month access? Why didn't I just make it like a a year-long access, or make it an indefinite access. Well, there's some good reasons why. Number one, I, I want participants to have a deadline. Yes, I want you to have a deadline. And I want that in order to, to promote purposeful attention and time toward the course. You know, I have a subscription to Apple Music, and because I know the music's there, and it's 
always going to be there. I feel very little need to set aside time specifically for it. Number two, people more greatly value that which is limited. Number three, I don't want you sharing your access to the course with 9,000 other people like a Netflix subscription and thereby cutting into my financial support. And number four, I may come up with something superior at some point, and I don't want to be obligated to continue uh, leaving this particular course active forever and ever and ever if I, in the future, do come up with something uh, superior to it. One person who is uh, taking the course currently wrote this. I've enrolled, and I'm on day two. This is fantastic. I've listened to all the podcasts numerous times, and I've read all the articles, and I've made great progress, but this structured course is really showing me how much work I still have to do. It's a wonderful resource and something I will definitely go through numerous times. Thank you, Brian. So, as I say, that course is now active, and uh, links to it are over at thelastsymptom.com. If you listen to this show because you enjoy the insights, the, the, uh, the epiphanies and the aha moments that uh, you get exposed to here, I want to encourage you to really consider taking the Last Symptom Fundamentals course, which is ready for your enrollment right now over at thelastsymptom.com. It really is going to take this experience and notch it up by 10. You know, so it is much more thorough, much more intimate, much more in-depth, and much more structured than anything I can offer you here with the podcast, just, just because of the very nature of, you know, the two different formats. Also, I alluded to this just a moment ago. The Last Symptom Friends and Family course I told you that I'm developing. This is a course that I'm designing specifically for those who may not have any specific emotional disorder themselves, but who care about somebody who does. This course, the Friends and Family course, will thoroughly cover the healthy laws and principles for dealing with those who have emotional disorders in the healthiest and most helpful way, as well as deeply explore the things one must do for himself or herself and why. I hope to have it ready in the weeks to come. Again, the name of that will be called The Last Symptom Friends and Family Course. When it's ready, I'll surely make an announcement here on the Last Symptom podcast, as well as provide information at thelastsymptom.com. If you're in the Facebook education group, I'll make announcements there as well. Speaking of the Last Symptom education group, I'd like to announce a couple of new groups. One is already active. As soon as you hear this show, it's, it'll be there. Um, and that group is called The Last Symptom Alumni. Again, these are Facebook groups, all right? The Last Symptom Alumni. This group is specifically intended only for those who are going through the Last Symptom Fundamentals course or have already gone through the Last Symptom Fundamentals course. It's specifically for you. That's your support system there. I want everybody who goes through the last symptom fundamentals course, which we just got done talking about in detail, that is now active and ready for your enrollment. Once you enroll, once you're in that course, you don't have to finish the course in order to join the group. You just have to be enrolled and currently going through the course. And then all who finish the course will also be welcome in the last symptom alumni Facebook group. This is a standalone group from the Last Symptom Education Group. The Last Symptom Education Group is a general group which serves as sort of a library of conversations around emotional disorder and authentic recovery. The Last Symptom Alumni Group 
is designed specifically for people who have the shared experience of going through the Last Symptom Fundamentals course. And soon I will be starting a brand new group, which will be called the Last Symptom Friends and Family Facebook group. Uh, A follower of mine recently said this about why she thinks a group like this would be so great. Let me read to you what she had to say. She said, personally, I think it would be great if Brian has the time to set up another Facebook group. There are other groups out there for loved ones or friends of those with borderline personality disorder, but they aren't educational groups, and they don't offer the choice to gain insights and enlightenment. The strict rules and clear guidelines that are maintained within this amazing group, she's talking about my education group on Facebook, ensure that we all work towards becoming or maintaining emotional health, even with the painful events that we encounter. If the group was divided, it would potentially allow both parties in a relationship to feel less inhibited and therefore more free to express themselves and to ask questions that are relevant to their own emotional health, which has to be their priority. I really like the way she worded that, and she really kind of nailed my thoughts behind creating another group. So that's three groups now that uh, I'll be running under the Last Symptom banner. You'll have the Last Symptom Education Group, which is the one that I've always had. You will now have the Last Symptom Alumni Group, which for the, is specifically for those who are enrolled in or who have completed any Last Symptom structured course. And then you'll have the Last Symptom Friends and Family Facebook Group, which is specifically for those who are dealing with people who have emotional disorders. What will be the point of that group? Well, my friend there who wrote the message summed it up pretty well. It's a place for those to, uh, uh, to become educated and enlightened uh, coming from their own direction in all this. Well, with that, changing topics just a little bit, I would like to share with you a message I got by somebody we'll just call R.W. on October 17th, 2020. This is beautiful, and I just, I just wanted to share it with you. She says, My very first breakthrough in understanding the foundations of personality disorder was listening to a wonderful podcast called The Last Symptom by Brian Barnett. I didn't consider myself to have borderline personality disorder because I couldn't make a correlation between the necessary diagnostic elements and my perception of myself, but there was so much about my emotional volatility which resonated but there was so much about my emotional volatility which resonated that I thought this would be a good podcast to investigate. It was a good decision. I remember working away in the paddock, looking after the animals and listening on my earphones, when all of a sudden, my mouth literally dropped open, and I stopped dead in my tracks. Brian was discussing the observation that no person can possibly be responsible for any other person's feelings. Having recently been deeply embroiled in another recent saga with my mother, There had been nothing more consistent and certain in my life than that I was wholly responsible for her feelings. Always. I was blown away. I had never even questioned my alleged culpability for my mother's state of being. It was my fault whenever I had done or said something or not done or said something, and I was expected to repent for any negative emotions she would dramatically or self-pityingly lay at my feet. Immediately on the back of that revelation was a more gigantic one, which directly correlated. Having always believed myself to be responsible and accountable for her feelings, I had an automatically internalized perception that other people 
were responsible for any negative impact they had on my feelings. I had spent a lifetime resenting people who had hurt me because they refused to take responsibility for my feelings. I had no idea we were each responsible for our own feelings or that anything could be done to change those feelings in any way. But by heck, it made so much glorious sense. I was 51, supposedly bright, had lived responsibly and financially supported myself my whole life, yet here I was, for the first time ever, understanding that we actually have responsibility for our own feelings and no one else's. I honestly can't express the impact of that realization. It was amazing and awful at the same time. This meant that I had been behaving in the way my mother had behaved toward me. Although our mechanisms were slightly different, we would both look to the relevant third party to regulate emotions that were absolutely none of their business, and we would punish them for failing to recognize their alleged responsibility. The enormity of this insight taught me how blind it is possible to be about something so significant. It also demonstrated how such insights become glaringly obvious once the light of consciousness finally lands on them. Wasn't that beautiful? I, uh, I copied that and saved that. I'm going to treasure that message for a long time. Those sorts of aha moments, those light bulb moments, the, the epiphanies, the revelations, the value of them cannot be overstated. They're just wonderful. It was for epiphanies like she had there while she was out dealing with the animals that got me to where I am now. You, you know, you're not always going to have huge epiphanies, but if you have one or two, that's enough. That's enough. One or two epiphanies is enough to do everything else that you need to do in your authentic recovery. So work toward that if you haven't had uh, your first enormous epiphany yet, all right? It's going to change your life. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming up to the weekend, so you know what that means, I hope. It means do something nice for yourself. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to tell you what. I am exhausted. <laughs> I've just been so busy lately with the last symptom that uh, naturally, you you know, it, it resulted in me getting the episode out late this week. And I just, I need a movie or something. I just need to think about uh I just need some recreation. Have you ever thought about what recreation is? Recreation comes from re-create. And recreation is meant to give you a break from work or from your responsibilities so that you're rejuvenated. You see, you're, you're recreated so that when you go back to these things, you, you do so rested and with more energy and enthusiasm. So that's what I'm going to do for myself this weekend. I think I'm going to watch a couple of good movies, uh, listen to some music, play the old guitar a little bit. I'd like you to do something nice for yourself as well. Now, as promised, I'm going to see if I can put you all to sleep here with a little bedtime story. So are you ready? <clears throat> Don't worry, this is not too long. This is uh, the introduction to Dandelion Wine by Ray Bradbury. I think you're going to like this. We will close out the show with the opening to Dandelion Wine. It was a quiet morning. The town covered over with darkness and at ease in bed. Summer gathered in the weather. The wind had the proper touch. The breathing of the world was long and warm and slow. You had only to rise, lean from your window, and know that this indeed was the first real time of freedom and living. 
This was the first morning of summer. Douglas Spaulding, 12, freshly wakened, let summer idle him on its early morning stream. Lying in his third-story couple of bedroom, he felt the tall power it gave him, riding high in the June wind, the grandest tower in town. At night, when the trees washed together, he flashed his gaze like a beacon from this lighthouse in all directions over swarming seas of elm and oak and maple. Now, boy, whispered Douglas, a whole summer ahead to cross off the calendar day by day, like the goddess Siva in the travel books. He saw his hands jump everywhere, pluck sour apples, peaches, and midnight plums. He would be clothed in trees and bushes and rivers. He would freeze gladly in the hoar-frosted ice house door. He would bake happily with 10,000 chickens in Grandma's kitchen. But now, a familiar task awaited him. One night each week, he was allowed to leave his father, his mother, and his younger brother Tom asleep in their small house next door and run here, up the dark spiral stairs to his grandparents' cupola. And in this sorcerer's tower sleep with thunders and visions to wake before the crystal jingle of milk bottles and perform his ritual magic. He stood at the open window in the dark, took a deep breath, and exhaled. The street lights, like candles on a black cake, went out. He exhaled again and again, and the stars began to vanish. Douglas smiled. He pointed a finger. There and there, now over here and here. Yellow squares were cut in the dim morning earth as house lights winked slowly on. A sprinkle of windows came suddenly alight miles off in dawn country. Everybody yawn, everybody up. The great house stirred below. Grandpa, get your teeth from the water glass. He waited a decent interval. Grandma and great-grandma, fry hot cakes. The warm scent of fried batter rose in the drafty halls to stir the boarders, the aunts, the uncles, the visiting cousins in their rooms. Street where all the old people live, wake up. Miss Helen Loomis, Colonel Freely, Miss Bentley, cough, get up, take pills, move around. Mr. Jonas, hitch up your horse. Get your junk wagon out and around. The bleak mansions across the town ravine opened baleful dragon eyes. Soon, in the morning avenues below, two old women would glide their electric green machine, waving at all the dogs. Mr. Trident, run to the car barn. Soon, Scattering hot blue sparks above it, the town trolley would sail the rivering brick streets. Ready, John Huff? Charlie Woodman? whispered Douglas to the street of children. Ready to baseballs, sponged deep in wet lawns to rope swings hung empty in trees. Mom, Dad, Tom, wake up! Clock alarms tinkled faintly. The courthouse clock boomed. Birds leaped from trees like a net thrown by his hand, singing. Douglas, conducting an orchestra, pointed to the eastern sky. The sun began to rise. He folded his arms and smiled, a magician's smile. Yes, sir, he thought. Everyone jumps, everyone runs when I yell. It'll be a fine season. He gave the town a last snap of his fingers. Doors slammed open. People stepped out. Summer 1928 began. <laughs>